So we are going to start this all important topic of polynomials. Polynomials are interesting by their own, but also they can be used to solve other problems. Okay. We will we'll see. So first of all, I mean, what is, let's just begin with the definition, right? What is the definition of a polynomial? Okay. So uh, uh, some of you may have seen. So what is polynomial for you? Even if you don't know the official or precise definition, uh, what is a polynomial? Okay, an expression. Ah, okay. And so first of all, it is an expression. So this is a very fundamental point that it's an expression. So uh, a lot of us are a lot of times we when we think of a polynomial, we just think of an equation. But that is not correct. Okay, so and this is a you know, it seems like a what do you call you know that kind of but it's not like that. It's this is not a polynomial. This is an equation. Okay, so that's why the word expression is important. This is a polynomial, and this difference is very uh, crucial in especially when you go to two variables and so on. Okay. Yes, so especially there. So it's an expression, and then the degree is a whole is a whole number. So just to make this more complete, it's what we call algebraic expression. It's an algebraic expression. Yeah. It is a language, right? It's a language in which maths, you know, the algebraic language, is how we find things, compute things without knowing. We assume x, and then we set up an equation and find it. So polynomials come naturally. There's no need to motivate that in that way, right? It's, it's clear. It's an algebraic expression. And then there is this something called degree. And degree is fine at the powers of x, right? A degree is a whole number. And that's important. Whole number. Okay, so I mean, all the, all the words are important here. Okay. So this is what a polynomial is. So because, see, this clear distinction is needed because when you do similar stuff like differential equations then the degree of a differential equation order of that degree of that what's the distinction and then you'll come to algebraic general algebraic expressions and so on so it's good to know this very clearly okay so uh, for example uh, this is not a polynomial this is a very interesting function but it's not a polynomial okay Okay, so so far we are not talking about it as functions. Eh? So far we are just talking about it as an expression, something that is just statically there. Okay. Uh, yeah, and okay. Now one question. So is this a polynomial? If you do, um, if I say I tell you, I give you this expression, would you call this a polynomial? Uh, okay, why? Um, okay, so you're saying the final power is the whole number. So you're saying you're you're kind of saying that once again, yeah, uh, you're kind of saying that this is equal to x, right? So does everybody agree with this? That this is the same thing as x. Is it the same thing as x? Yes, that is the problem, right? I mean, when you say when you say just when you just say square root, yeah, what is what does square root mean, right? Something that when you square, you get the inside thing, right? What does this mean? Yeah, this is just a number t, yeah. And what is that t? The t is something that when you square the t, you get a. Okay, right. And so when you take when you take minus x, right? Yeah, when you take minus x and um, yeah, sorry. So when you take minus x and you square it, right? Uh, oh, hold on. So uh, what was I trying to say? I just lost my track of train of thought. Sorry. Let's just back up one second. So 
yes, I got into this meaning of the square root. Okay, something whose square is equal to what is there inside. Okay, and obviously when you take minus x, then its its square is also same as x square. Okay, yeah. So minus x square is also x square, right? So this means that this could also be equal to minus x, and that is where the that is where the problem comes. So this is not a polynomial. Yeah. So the final power is is okay. You could say that, but then you see, yeah, it's not even a function. It's it's a, there's a problem, right? There are two. no uh, no because there is a 2 right no so if you solve it then it becomes half then it if you just go like that then it seems only to be x right so there's no 1 by 4 coming by any means that's clear okay yeah okay um modulus of so where do you want to write the modulus um yes so yeah so okay so just so it's the same thing uh, so we let's not use the word modulus for now and just say so when you take square root then don't you take the positive yeah so then i don't know yeah then let's see what happens so if we if if we just say this positive square root let's say positive uh square yeah then it's a polynomial positive square root of x square yeah um yeah so uh, no but it, so now now is this equal to x that's my question that's the question yeah ishana is this right uh, now again if it's something else then so let's let's try to answer this is the positive square root of x square equal to x? Well, I think no, right? Because you take minus 2 and you take its square. But when you take positive square root, you would say 2. You won't say minus 2. So this is a, this is a problematic function. Yeah, and it is precisely equal to something called mod x, which is what it means just to take the answer and make it positive. Okay, but uh, let's not go into that. It's already clear that it is not, it doesn't. And if you put mod x, a mod x is not a basically what I was asking is mod x uh, a polynomial. Okay, okay. If you don't know what mod x means, it's not, not important, but it's just, uh, uh, yeah, cool. And if you know, then you know it's not a polynomial uh, because it has the graphically and so on, also. But yeah, anyways. So that's the thing. So one has to be very, that's why these definitions are needed. One may think, oh, now what are we doing all these definitions for? But it, it's it's there. It's important. So okay. So so we have defined polynomials. Yeah, that's fine. And obviously there are expressions like these, like e to the x. This is not a polynomial. Okay, and so on. So there are two views uh, to polynomials. So one is this expression view, which is just that it is an expression. Okay, this has its advantages and disadvantages or whatever we'll you'll see it when we do things. But the other is that we want to, this is a very crucial point, okay, then we'll come to some uh, problems maybe. View uh, polynomials, and this is something that we naturally do. We want to view polynomials as functions. Okay? Uh, by function, I just mean that it just takes some, that in place of x, you could put some numbers. Okay. And we will just use a notation p of x, which means that it's something that takes inputs x. Okay? And it's a function. If you know that, then that's fine. And then, for example, you could take anything. Okay. We want to think of this polynomial. So to begin with, it is just an expression. Okay, It is not a function. It is just that they're statically there. Okay. Okay, now what does it mean? It is just there. Then how is it of any interest? Like my question is, so maybe uh, for some time we'll discuss these things. Maybe okay. So my question is like, if you remove this thing, 
then how is these expressions of any interest well they are not they are not completely uninteresting right because you could for example have this rule of multi which surely you guys know right there is a rule way okay let this maybe you would not use the rule to do this but you know there is a rule in which you can multiply right you know that obviously collecting powers and so on yeah so there is a rule to multiply there is a rule to add and also divide but that's okay that comes later yeah so even the point is that even when you don't see polynomials as functions but just as algebraic expressions we have all these polynomials uh, all these algebraic expressions yeah they are not just uninteresting they are still interacting in the sense that you take two polynomials you multiply you can define a third one by multiplying and we know the rule right you could add you could subtract and you get a third one so there are some rules there okay there are some rules so that's the expression view and that has a lot of power to it because that uh, okay that's not going to it. so uh okay so we'll not go into that uh, why it's useful to view it just as expressions but uh, one question when is a polynomial zero so not seeing it as functions okay when is a polynomial uh zero okay so first of all we have a definition called the zero polynomial okay just this now this is just an algebraic expression right it's an all this looks very trivial but you will see see when you take polynomials and you want to view the coefficients in modulo p modulo 3 modulo 4 then all these things we really used to so you see this zero that's yeah that's just a zero polynomial are there any other zero polynomials are there any other polynomials that can be equal to zero polynomial yeah. suppose i tell you that this polynomial is equal to the zero this is really just a rule there is no theorem here this is just a rule yeah and we know the rule that if this polynomial is zero then the rule is that all these three have to be zero now no one we cannot question it right because we are not seeing it as a function so we don't have to prove that at each point it gives output zero okay then all the coefficients must be zero we are not questioning like that right this is just a rule okay yeah so polynomial is zero if and only if all the coefficients are zero obviously if all coefficients are zero then it's zero but uh, if it is a zero polynomial if you want to call it a zero polynomial then it is just that coefficient is zero so basically the my point point of this thing is that if you take one expression like this and again this thing and you take another expression like this then when are these two expressions equal if you're going to call again this is again just a definition right if you want to call these two things equal then you better have that this is equal to this and then b1 is equal to a1 and b0 equals to a1 now that's not a new rule that i'm giving you that rule follows from the previous rule does anybody see yeah how it follows from the previous like this being equal implies that b0 equal to a b2 equal to a2 b1 equal to a1 again these are just rules okay this thing do you see how this rule follows from this rule no so again x cannot be zero or anything x is a variable yeah so this is a very important point here that x is not a number and that's precisely the point that we are not viewing these things as functions yet but just as expressions okay these these are constants and so these are as far as we have we are concerned constants are for us numbers right so these are numbers okay but x is not a number and that is why a uh, saying whether this is zero or not has to really come from a definition because these are completely new objects in that sense right uh, we don't yet have a we don't have a pre notion of zero so far so that's the rule that's why we have a rule number 1 has to be there but then 
does rule number two follow from rule number one? That is my question. the roots of the equation see so again when you use the word roots then you are already saying that it's a function uh, unless you have a different unless you define roots in a way completely algebraically right so that's a uh, yeah so we cannot use the word roots so far because we're not viewing it as a function obviously uh, there is a way to define but yeah And so if a polynomial is zero, then in fact, every number is, is its root. So it has infinitely many roots. But if, if you want to say that. Yeah. So rule number two follows from rule number one, right? Just, just treat it like a, just an algebra question, right? So rule number two says this is equal, I mean, to begin with the hypothesis is that the left-hand side is equal to the right-hand side. But then you could just clearly write it like this, because again, as I said, if they have subtraction, addition, multiplication, and those are those rules I'm not writing. Those are, you know, otherwise we not <laughs> never get started. Okay. So, and, you're, and if, if you have any doubts, please tell me that's equal to zero, right? But then what does rule number one tell me? That this has to be zero, this has to be zero, and this has to be zero. And that means, yeah, these these things are these things are just there, okay, for now. And you see, okay. so the notion of zero for a polynomial is very strong. Even by the definition, notion of zero is really strong. Like when a polynomial is zero or not, it's a really strong condition. And that is one of the very usefulness of uh, polynomials. You can get many things at once. You get a lot of zeros, a lot of things are zero at once, or you get a lot of equalities at the same time. Polynomials are very powerful. Okay? So, but now we take a different view, the function view. Okay? And this is just where the, uh, analysis, calculus, you know, graph, those techniques come in to study the same things, okay? Polynomials. So we have this px is equal to this. So now what do I, what do I mean when I say view it as a function? I mean, just that there are input outputs, okay? So p of zero would be, I should just use the same color. p of zero would be just put the values, right? It's just one, okay? p of one, just put the values, you know, one cube, so on, so on, right? So it's just five. And so now it's a function. It's just something that takes in inputs and give you output. Okay. So you see, we have defined polynomials in two different ways. So now does do any questions pop up? Whenever you define something in two different ways, some questions ought to come, right? Some issues ought to come in that, in that sense I'm asking. Uh, sorry, the roots or rules? Uh, huh, so does it work? That's what we need to understand. That's right. Does the rule, does the same, do the same rules work? Okay. So, well, the rules for multiplication and so on, again, I'm not checking. Okay. Forget, we we'll leave that. Yeah. But let's think about the rule for zero. Okay. If, okay, now let me not, uh, uh, let me just say, if Px is a zero function, what does it mean? First of all, well, we know that zero function means that 
p of just to say p of c is zero for any c. Okay. So now let me just change this. Uh, I mean, so just this is what Aparna said. The same rule should work. So we need to check, right? That if this is zero as a function, then it should also be zero as a polynomial in that polynomial rule. So it means that all the coefficients must be zero. So we should check that, right? This is a one. Okay, please interrupt me, otherwise I will not know because some some of you may have done a bit of polynomials, some of you may not have done this, so I don't know. Okay. So if px is this, now this is we are viewing it as a function, okay? such that p of c is zero for any c, then what do we want to show? Please someone tell me. Components, right? All the components, right? Components is a very good. So we usually say coefficients, but in fact, components are also something that is used uh, in, in some sense. Yeah. So all these we want to show are zero. Now, how do we now viewing it as functions? How do we do it? And now all this is not difficult. This is just understanding something clearly. It's not about these are not problems or anything. These are just checks. But let's do it. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I can you say again? Ha, huh, yes, okay, I couldn't hear you. It, uh, yes, I mean, as a function, yeah, as a graph, it will be x axis, but then why should all the coefficients be zero? Viewing it as functions, right? Why should why should a not be zero? Yes, we'll soon be start graphing them. Graphing is very very important. Uh, so we know a lot of things before we prove it. Yeah, when we graph things. Mm, see, uh, no, obviously is a, no, but why not, like, why not just they cancel out and so on? Like you put a C, for example, you put two, then A3 is negative and A2 is positive. So two cube and somehow, somehow they cancel out. Why cannot they cancel out? You see, I mean, certainly there are some values of C for which PX can be zero, right? Like, uh, right? ah, but those are, those are much later. We cannot, <laughs> yeah, this thing is, no, in the sense, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's. Uh huh? Uh, yeah, that's right. So, so how do you use that here? Uh, yes. I mean, yes, that's certainly a, that's certainly a possibility, but we want to say that is not, that will not happen because there are for all C it is zero, right? Because for too many C's it is zero. Yeah. So you see, this is such a simple question, but we are not able to explain it 
in a sim in a in a honest way right from no again why because uh, but then it could cancel out with the other things right yeah uh, it i mean it will not i know it's a very silly thing that i'm saying but yeah satya what about you what do you think um yeah 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 but then yeah but then what we are trying to say is that they won't they will not like cancel out but they will be zero identically and that is because there are so many c's for which it is zero okay so let me simplify the question so this is these are the simple things which are which we have to do first okay, okay this is let's uh, let me ask you this yeah let's see if uh, anyone can answer so now this is not should not be difficult yeah pragdish do you know why should the constant term be zero let's just think about the constant term can you can you think why the constant term a not should be zero so can you find a c which brings out the a not to the sir uh, yeah so the question now is why should a not be zero i mean this is a simpler question right uh any other but we don't have any other i mean it's still yeah i mean it's trivial thing okay but yeah any other number i think yes just put c equal to 0 p of 0 is a not when you put 0 in the function yeah from the rules we have to play okay when you put 0 in the function then we get a not as a function but we are told that this is 0 and so a not is 0 now think about a1 from a, i want this precise reasoning because intuition we all have right? it should be 0 all of us know even some who not the no any any math they also know they also can say but uh, when one is to prove this yeah. these are important because when the coefficients become other things not necessarily numbers then uh, you know these things uh, have to be so why should a not be zero you have to bring out a not somehow or do some other some other way now it should not be difficult now it's similar reasoning to say now you could say if someone knows derivatives they can say i'll take the derivative of this and then a not becomes a one comes out then i'll substitute zero in the derivative that's not that's okay but uh, derivatives are much far much much far so already what we have done we can use it to remove the a not uh, we can remove the a not from from what we have done so far right now why should a1 be zero okay so let's take x common and this is something we can do because for each x is a just x is just going to be put as a number and you can even take common when you view it as polynomial as expressions but yeah we are viewing it as functions so you can take x common and i'm just removing this condition i mean this is okay we know this 
All right. So then, what do we do? Yeah, so you have simplified the function, maybe, but uh, but say now you cannot you cannot say that you cannot say that this is zero for all x. Right? We cannot say that that this has to be zero for all x and so because no because especially for x equal to zero which you need, and this need not be zero. Right, so you see, such a simple question, and we are getting stuck, and that's the that's the thing. Okay, so think about it. Just spend some more time. Try to find a reason. Okay, that okay. Now, as functions, uh, why should all the terms be zero? Okay, maybe it uh, it would have been better to prove that the highest term is zero. So you could you have to think. Okay, there is no one way to do it. Maybe you could prove that the highest term is zero by some argument and make it precise as much as you can, and then sort of okay. Now that is zero. So now you come to and use induction, but don't just say. I mean, just to say it, you can say okay. Now the second highest, you know, you get a similar stuff. uh if you do p of 1 yeah then you know that this is zero right right uh, so then yeah so then again one has to i mean there are there are myriads of ways to do this many many ways but we want to yeah say it in a certain way precisely okay you want to say it in any way you say, but it has to be precise and from first principles. Okay, as much as so think about this. So, think, uh, come, try to. Okay, just think. I cannot say complete. You may not to complete it. Yes. Okay, so let's let's move on. Yeah. So basically, the point of polynomial theory is to understand polynomials as functions. We take help of the algebraic. Things and then to understand it as an algebraic thing, uh, we use the fact that it's a function and back and forth we keep doing. Okay, yeah. But let me state something, uh, say something which can be one of the short-term goals. Um, no, so. So the point now is that you can safely view polynomials as both functions and expressions. Okay, that's something that we can now do. Yeah. But this is what we want to do. We want to understand. Okay, we want to determine uh, we want to determine p x, the polynomial p x. Okay? So any degree you could. Think of degree three or two, whatever degree n also. So we want to determine px, yeah, by as few, I mean, as less information as possible, but as few input values as possible. So what do I mean? 
So let's say that Px is a quadratic. Okay. Px is a quadratic. Yeah. And if I tell you that, so, okay, this is all given that I'm writing, so I don't need to write given. Uh, let's say I tell you that P of one is one, P of two is one, and P of three is also one. Yeah. Then how many or how many quadratics uh, can can you find? With these three constraints, yeah, how many quadratics can you find? Zero, one, two. So just work it out and you would, you would know. Oh, so, oh, so, okay. So then what are those? Okay. Then try to say, then what are those three? So this is just a question. We are not sure. So this is just work it out, do the calculations, and then you would know how many you can get. So this is just in the realm of functions. Mostly we are asking the question, but the answer may need to view the algebraic side also, but I don't know, but as functions we are asking. So just put the values and see you, if you can find the coefficients or if you, some coefficients are left depending on the other, you would know, right? So just put the values and see. I mean, there are better, many other ways to do it, but to begin with, you can just do that. X minus one, no, 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 X minus one, I don't know. But P of one equal to one just means that you put one in the polynomial, right? So P of one is equal to one. P of one is just A2 plus A1 plus A0. Yeah. So for as of now, this is all it means for us. To begin, I mean, obviously, if you can notice some other feature that's. So we know this, that the sum of the three coefficients is equal to one. No, no such thing. So let's say that our, where we are is reals. Okay. Whatever reals mean, whatever we are, it's not important to know exact definition. Reals, uh, rationals, irrationals, anything.
I, so so why don't we just write the values and try to solve it right just put p of sorry just put uh, so one is equal to p of two and i'm not writing p again just put two at two times two four so just do these things then you put two right two a one so the x was on the right but i'm not writing it on the left right uh this was two so a one two, but usually we write the constants first, and uh, two times a one is same as a one times two. We are in the in that kind of place. We are in num real numbers. Everything just you can uh, do it in any order. All that is fine. And then again we get this. Now you just need to solve these three equations, right? Simultaneous equations. This is like that. Yeah? But this seems like a tedious way. Even if you get some answer in the end, it seems like a tedious way. And uh, yeah, uh, certainly we would love if there's a better way. Right? But anyways, yeah. So we now need to find a not a one, a two, which satisfies this, or how many, you know, triples of a not a one, a two satisfy it. Yeah, so surely you can solve this, right? This is just a three. Uh, just use some sort of elimination, something, something like that, right? So, yeah, there are subtract this two, maybe uh, you get zero, and it's especially simple because the zeros are coming, right? Too many zeros, many many zeros. I mean, a lot of zeros, whatever. This, if you subtract the last two in the right order, and then the first two you do. Uh, And again, you can uh, you can again uh, do. Uh, oh, <laughs> yeah. So you get uh, you see. So we subtract this two. I mean, so what are the values that we get? We get a two equal to zero. We also get a one equal to zero. Yeah, you just put it. And then also a not. Oh, sorry. We get a not equal to one. Ah, right. Sorry. Yeah, we get a not equal to one. Yeah. Right. And you see, there is no other choice. These are the only three. This is the only pos. Not three pos. These are the only. This, this is the only possibility. Does everybody agree? Right. Because I just went in the in that in the you know order that okay if this is true this implies this this implies this this implies this whatever then this implies this so this is the only possibility and obviously it works you can put it and see right so how many quadratics do we get well one can say we get zero quadratics yeah or let me um uh, let's just uh, no. So uh, really, yeah. So the answer would be. Let me just say the answer is to begin with that p x is equal to one for all x. Yeah, for all x, p x becomes one because p x is one. No, that's what we are getting, right? We are getting a naught is one and the other two are zero. Okay, so it's not even a quadratic in that strict definition. Yeah, but that's just a word it depends uh, yeah. so in that way the answer is zero otherwise the answer is a unique thing we get a unique polynomial so let's see if there are any questions so far huh? unique means only one so we only get one polynomial and that polynomial has to be just one, right? So what we have shown is that A2 has to be zero, A1 has to be zero and A0 has to be one, right? And this, this is the only possibility is what we have shown and this possibility certainly works, 
So this is the only polynomial. So it's unique polynomial. Yeah. So it's a unique. Yeah. So is it clear to everyone? Please. Uh, then I'll try to say more. <clears throat> yeah. So okay. Yes, so we would like to say that a naught equals to a naught equals to one and the other two equal to zero. Right, directly. Uh, yeah, so how do we say it directly? Huh? Yeah, so well, the idea is that see, you would you certainly know that a naught equal to one and the other two equal to zero works, right? That Everybody, if you have to make a guess, that's the guess. But then to say that that is the only possibility is my question, is the question that initially we are asking, right? Determine the polynomial by as few input values as possible. So here the answer is that if you have a quadratic, then if you are given three input output information, yeah, if you're giving, if you're given input auto information at three points, then there is only one such polynomial. Now that one has to prove first, right? Then you could, as you saying, directly say that, right? Okay. Yeah. Is this point clear to everyone, right? So we are basically want, we are basically trying to say that a polynomial px is determined by one one more than its degree the input output values for one more than its degree yeah so but we have not proved it okay a polynomial and this is the beautiful thing about polynomials right a polynomial or let's just say a quadratic polynomial to begin with the the reasonings would be exactly same, but uh, yeah, quadratic. I'll just say like this: polynomial is uniquely determined, or in other words, there is only one such polynomial determined by any three values and values you understand any three input output values, right? So not just one, two, three, one, two, three is not special here. Yeah. You could give P of anything, 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 output, anything, 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 and you will get a polynomial and you will get only one polynomial. For this, you could just solve equations and check for three degree. So I shouldn't say a, um, anything, right? Uh, C1, C2, C3, and any D1, D2, D3. C1, C2, C3 have to be distinct. Otherwise, you are, um, otherwise they are not three values, right? Three input output. The outputs could be anything. So this is the thing. Point is there are two things here. Okay. One thing is that three. If you give me three values, I'm just using the word value now. Okay. Then you cannot get. Then you will get only one such polynomial. So for a quadratic, three values are enough to completely draw the picture. Three points are enough to complete the picture. That's the rigidity about polynomials. Okay, they are rigid in that sense. Okay. If, if you're given it's a quadratic, now if you're given it's a cubic, then four values will be enough. If you're given four values, then there cannot be more than one such cubic. And there will be exactly one. There will be one. That's another thing. That's another side. Now, this means once you know these two things, then it means that you make a guess. If you can guess, then you make that, you make a guess. And if that guess is correct, then that's it. There's no more. Okay. And these are the things we would like to prove. This is a lot of work that one has to do to prove these things and uh, simultaneously see problems and so on. Okay. So this is just a little non-traditional track to the same thing that you would find and not, not, nothing is nothing some different it's the same thing that you find in the books but maybe it's just a different uh, just a yeah, same geodesic path to the same thing 
So, yeah. So, but how should we approach this question? And how do we say that if you are given three values and you will get one polynomial? What should be the reasoning? So let's. I think let's first try to. You know, get some sort of intuitive reasoning if someone can provide because we've already done it for one case. So from here, why why should there be you know only one quadratic, or why should there be no more than one quadratic? At most one. See the reason is that you will be setting up equations, right? You will have three equations and three variables, and the sense is that when you have three equations and three variables, you should not get. More than one solution, right? If they are good equations, because but that's not always the case. Actually, basically the thing is that you get three linear equations. Is that right? Linear we get right because a not a one and a two they don't get squared or anything, right? You put values, you put c one, c one would be like hundred, so you put hundred in place of x, you get some value, let's say two hundred. And something like that. Three linear equations in three variables. This is the thing. If you have three linear equations in three variables, if they are good equations, then you get only one solution. That's not hard to believe, right? If you have two linear equations in two variables, then you get only one solution. Most of the times. Right now, that you would know, two conditions, and uh, you can say it in many ways. X plus two y equal to four. You see that you get one solution. So it's just the analog of that three linear equations, three variables. You get one solution. Sometimes you don't get one solution. Sometimes you get many solutions, and uh, then we want to talk about all that. But that's yeah. But this is just the this is just the rough reasoning. This by no means is a proof. Okay. So uh, this provides motivation to explore, uh, to prove this fact in certain kinds of equations. But let's not get into that. Yeah. How do we approach this question? How do we say that from here there is at most one polynomial? From these conditions, how do we say that there is at most one polynomial? But the three conditions are enough. That is what we want to say. So, we simplify the problem. When I mean, you cannot find a solution, you simplify the problem, right? So, the natural simplification is to well, let's say that these values were one. Now, let's say these values are zero. Now, can we find a reason? You know this may be a very very special case, but uh, uh, can we, yeah, find some reason? Yes, right. But then, what is the explanation? Yeah, that's the correct uh, guess. So basically, we want to say from here that the p x is actually zero for all x, or as a algebraic expression, it is zero. Same thing. But then, what's the reason? How do we reason it? Right. We we need to yeah no. So this is where uh, we can use some algebra. Right? Is it possible to do it by without algebra? Um, I don't know. Right? It seems as if one has to use algebra from here. 
So now it's standard. This is the thing. That's right. That's correct. Yeah. That's right. We, yeah, that's right. And uh, that is certainly what we certainly something which you'll use, but maybe we'll need a little bit more. So we want to see this condition is analytic in the sense that this is on the, you know, it's a function value. The, the graph hits the x-axis or just like this. We want to turn this into an algebraic equivalent. Can we do it? Now this, hmm? P of C1 is, uh, is, no, P of C1, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, I didn't understand. Can you say again? Yeah, but how do you say that? Yes, so that is what we want to prove, right? Yes, just like so. I mean, if you go by an analogy, then it's fine. It, that's that's the same thing as previous problem. But one should prove it. Again, you can set up equations and prove, but we want to prove it in a way that doesn't need equations and so on, right? I mean, three equations, then four variables. Three variables have become four equations and. So we want to not use that argument and we don't want to just go by, okay, it happened for the other case, so it will happen, right? Uh, so we want to find a way. So now this is the thing, P of C1 being zero, we want to use it algebraically. So there we will use this condition. We will divide this division. This is the algebraic thing. What this just means is that, but let's just use the word divide first because we are familiar with it. Divide Px by x minus c1. Right? Divide Px by x minus c1. So Px is this, huh? Uh, See, x minus c1 cannot be, I mean, x minus c1, what do you mean by x minus c1 is zero? Yeah, but x minus c1 being zero, what does it even mean? Because this, that's a polynomial, right? I mean, this is not a zero polynomial. This is this does not make sense because it's, it's not zero as a polynomial. You see, I mean, so it's just the line, maybe you're trying to say, but uh, I, yeah. But it, it's wrong to say that x minus c1 is zero because it's not a zero polynomial. It's this is certainly not zero. X is there, right? And the coefficient of x is one, so it's not zero. But yeah, at c1 it is zero, right? So we divide p x by x minus c1, okay? And we check the remainder. Yeah? So this is something that we do. So you divide it, and then you get a quotient. And then you get a remainder. Now the remainder, the degree of the remainder. Now we will prove this at some point, but maybe we are. So have you guys done division of polynomials by polynomials and yeah, just the basics. So I don't want anything. I don't need anything fancy. Okay, just you take one polynomial and you try to you know group it. You know in terms of s minus c one. And then just assume that there is a remainder. Okay, so essentially you're just grouping the things. Right? You're just grouping the finding pieces of x minus c1 in the polynomial, and then just grouping it. Okay, uh, if you cannot do it, uh, you can force it in some sense, right? Because it's sort of I'll just show you how you how it's a very natural thing. You can do something like this add and subtract, right? And then you can do the same with x square, right? You can replace the x square 
by x minus c plus c and then you expand it then the x minus c1 part you group and the other part is your remainder so you can always do it now again there are some more things there but you can certainly be done now obviously we know a very good euclidean formula and you know the long division and so on which is basically just uh, uh, maybe some point you can try to prove it that it's correct that it gives the right answer but it does seem to give the right answer all the time but the key thing here which you're going to use is the remainder the degree of the remainder is one less uh, okay it's less sorry not one less it's just it's just less it's less than x degree of what you're dividing by and so it has to be a constant now that's important it has to be a constant okay let's call it capital c now what is this constant so this is this is what algebra gives you okay because this division and remainder is an algebra thing right having this expression breaking px in terms of x minus c and seeing what you are finally left with okay is is algebra now what is c can we find c c is a we know that c is a number can we find c answer is yes right you could just it is zero yes that's exactly that's right and this is even just a theorem it's called the remainder factor theorem but it's just as you can see now we are viewing it as a function and putting values in it okay this is given to be zero so c is zero okay and so what do we know we know that px begins to look like this and now uh, we know that qx has to be linear again okay and you can apply the same, qx is linear right qx is now a linear polynomial now that's something that saparna said that i mean if you want to get a quadratic you have a linear the other thing has to be linear because again that's follows from the rule of multiplication if you can just explain it right so this is linear again you can apply the same reasoning and show that x minus c2 is a factor of it right but then you will get some a quotient that has to be constant it not be one it can be some constant what constant will it let's just say some constant let's not yeah this thing okay? if i given those roots c1 and c2 then this is what you get okay and this is the algebra connection okay given this how it behaves as a function in a simplest way 0 0 as the outputs for certain three values or two values whatever then you could say how it looks like algebraically okay we'll continue with this thing okay but you should guys should try to explain it on your own from here okay? why px has to be zero is there still something to be done but the question is from here how could you say that px has to be zero but because you're given one more condition so you have to use it okay? think about it i don't want answer now but let me just state what we have proved and we have proved an important result okay? let me just state that so just state that here in the corner this is the standard it's called the remainder factor okay? you could find it anywhere in a school book also you can find it okay so remainder factor theorem so it's saying that uh, p of c is equal to zero okay this uh, actually the thing is that p of c is equal to um r yeah this is the same thing as px leaves a remainder of r when divided by c obviously we have a special case of that when r is zero so it becomes a factor right so the uh, yeah so it basically means that if it's a zero if p of c gives a zero then x minus c is a factor this is the thing and this is the main thing okay that if something gives a zero then it then algebraically it becomes a factor this this thing is this uh, good thing we don't have when you go to two variables okay this is the best thing that is there for one variable for okay and everything is just from the division algorithm okay so this is the fact and you can uh, if you begin to do polynomial questions this is what this is the fact that you'll use all the time 
Yeah. So let me just stop here. Okay, I promise to stop on time because people get late for things and so on. So yes, so that's it. Now you can do use any book, any place you Google, and you can try. But for 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 me to say, you can follow exercise ten point four. Okay, uh, from uh, challenges and thrills. Okay, chapter ten. Just try to see chapter. There's a lot of things there. Just the chapter ten. You can follow exercise number ten point four from problem number. Especially, I'll be interested in the last few problems. Okay, in exercise ten point four. But anywhere you will find it. Even NCRT miscellaneous, you can do first. It's not a yeah. It will be there. So do from anywhere. Okay, that is up to you. But just for me to say, I so that there's something that you know is there to be done. Okay. Okay. As we do more, then more interesting for. And obviously today already we have a few questions. We have a question here in the beginning of the class. We had a question. I don't know about the middle. Try them. Spend as much time as you can. Uh, that's the that's the thing. 